and seven times never kill man. Ye may kill for yourselves, and your mates, and your cubs as they need, and ye can, but kill not for pleasure of killing, and seven times never kill man. Rudyard Kipling Outside the walls the Janshi children hung, a row of small gray-furred bodies still and motionless at the ends of long ropes. The oldest among them, obviously, had been slaughtered before hanging. Here a headless male swung upside down, the noose around the feet, while there dangled the blast-burned carcass of a female. But most of them, the dark, hairy infants with the wide golden eyes, most of them had simply been hanged. Toward dusk, when the wind came swirling down out of the ragged hills, the bodies of the lighter children would twist at the ends of their ropes and bang against the city walls, as if they were alive and pounding for admission. But the guards on the walls paid the thumping no mind as they walked their relentless rounds and the rust-streaked metal gates did not open. Do you believe in evil? Arik Nekral asked Janice Ryther, as they looked down on the city of steel angels from the crest of a nearby hill. Anger was written across every line of his flat, yellow-brown face, as he squatted among the broken shards of what once had been a Janshi worship pyramid. Evil? Ryther murmured in a distracted way. Her eyes never left the red stone walls below, where the dark bodies of the children were outlined starkly. The sun was going down, the fat red globe that the steel angels called the Heart of Bacalon, and the valley beneath them seemed to swim in bloody mists. Evil, Nekral repeated. The traitor was a short, pudgy man, his features decidedly mongoloid, except for the flame-red hair that fell nearly to his waist. It is a religious concept, and I am not a religious man. Long ago, when I was a very child, growing up on IMRL, I decided that there was no good or evil, only different ways of thinking. His small, soft hands felt around in the dust until he had a large, jagged shard that filled his fist. He stood and offered it to Ryther. The steel angels have made me believe in evil again, he said. She took the fragment from him wordlessly and turned it over in her hands. Ryther was much taller than Necrol and much tinier a hard, bony woman with a long face, short black hair, and eyes without expression. The sweat-stained coveralls she wore hung loosely on her spare frame. Interesting, she said finally, after studying the shard for several minutes. It was as hard and smooth as glass, but stronger, colored a translucent red, yet so very dark it was almost black. A plastic? she asked, throwing it back to the ground. Necral shrugged. That was my very guess. But of course it is impossible. The Janshi work in bone and wood, and sometimes metal. But plastic is centuries beyond them. Or behind them, Ryther said. You say these worship pyramids are scattered all through the forest? Yes, as far as I have ranged but the angels have smashed all those close to their valley to drive the Janshi away. As they expand, and they will expand, they will smash others. Ryther nodded. She looked down into the valley again, and as she did, the last sliver of the heart of Bacalon slid below the western mountains, and the city lights began to come on. The Janshi children swung in pools of soft blue illumination, and just above the city gates, 
two stick figures could be seen working. Shortly they heaved something outward, a rope uncoiled, and then another small dark shadow jerked and twitched against the wall. Why? Ryther said in a cool voice, watching. Necrawl was anything but cool. The gen she tried to defend one of their pyramids. Spears and knives and rocks against the steel angels, with lasers and blasters and screech guns. But they caught them unaware. Killed a man. The proctor announced it would not happen again. He spat. Evil. The children trust them, you see. Interesting, Ryther said. Can you do anything? Necral asked, his voice agitated. You have your ship, your crew. The Gen she need a protector, Janice. They are helpless before the angels. I have four men in my crew, Ryther said evenly. Perhaps four hunting lasers as well. That was all the answer she gave. Necral looked at her helplessly. Nothing? Tomorrow, perhaps, the proctor will call on us. He has surely seen the lights descend. Perhaps the angels wish to trade. She glanced again into the valley. Come, Marik. We must go back to your base. The trade goods must be loaded. Wyatt, proctor of the children of Bacalon on the world of Corlos, was tall and red and skeletal, and the muscles stood out clearly on his bare arms. His blue-black hair was cropped very short. His carriage was stiff and erect. Like all the steel angels, he wore a uniform of chameleon cloth, a pale brown now as he stood in the full light of day on the edge of the small, crude space field, a mesh steel belt with hand laser and communicator and screech gun, and a stiff red Roman collar. The tiny figurine that hung on a chain about his neck, the pale child Bacalon, nude and innocent and bright-eyed, but holding a great black sword in one small fist, was the only sign of Wyatt's rank. Four other angels stood behind him, two men, two women, all dressed identically. There was a sameness about their faces, too. The hair always cropped tightly, whether it was blonde or red or brown. The eyes alert and cold and a little fanatic. The upright posture that seemed to characterize members of the military religious sect. The bodies hard and fit. Necral who was soft and slouching and sloppy, disliked everything about the angels. Proctor Wyatt had arrived shortly after dawn, sending one of his squad to pound on the door of the small gray prefab bubble that was Necral's trading base and home. Sleepy and angry, but with a guarded politeness, the trader had risen to greet the angels and had escorted them out to the center of the space field, where the scarred metal teardrop of the lights of Jolastar squatted on three retractable legs. The cargo ports were all sealed now. Ryther's crew had spent most of the evening unloading Necral's trade goods and replacing them in the ship's hold with crates of Janshi artifacts that might bring good prices from collectors of extraterrestrial art. No way of knowing until a dealer looked over the goods. Ryther had dropped Necral only a year ago and this was the first pickup. I am an independent trader, and Arik is my agent on this world, Ryther told the proctor when she met him on the edge of the field. You must deal through him. I see, Proctor Wyatt said. He still held the list he had offered Ryther, of goods the angels wanted from the industrialized colonies on Avalon and Jameson's world. But Necral will not deal with us. Ryther looked at him blankly. With good reason, Necral said. I trade with the Janshi. You slaughter them. The proctor had spoken to Necral often in the months since the Steel Angels had established their city colony, and the talks had all ended in arguments. 
Now he ignored him. The steps we took were needed, Wyatt said to Ryder. When an animal kills a man, the animal must be punished, and other animals must see and learn, so that beasts may know that man, the seed of earth and child of Bacalon, is the lord and master of them all. Necral snorted. The Janshi are not beasts, Proctor. They are an intelligent race, with their own religion and art and customs, and they... Wyatt looked at him. They have no soul. Only the children of Bacalon have souls, only the seed of earth. What mind they may have is relevant only to you, and perhaps them. Soulless, they are beasts. Arik has shown me the worship pyramids they build, Ryther said. Surely creatures that build such shrines must have souls. The proctor shook his head. You are in error in your belief. It is written clearly in the book. We, the seed of earth, are truly the children of Bacalon, and no others. The rest are animals, and in Bacalon's name we must assert our dominion over them. Very well, Ryther said. But you will have to assert your dominion without aid from the lights of Jolastar, I'm afraid. And I must inform you, Proctor, that I find your actions seriously disturbing, and intend to report them when I return to Jameson's world. I expected no less, Wyatt said. Perhaps by next year you will burn with the love of Bacalon, and we may talk again. Until then, the world of Corlos will survive. He saluted her and walked briskly from the field followed by the four steel angels. What good will it do to report them? Necral said bitterly, after they had gone. None, Ryther said, looking off toward the forest. The wind was kicking up the dust around her, and her shoulders slumped as if she were very tired. The Jamies won't care, and if they did, what could they do? Necral remembered the heavy, red-bound book that Wyatt had given him months ago. And Bacalon, the pale child, fashioned his children out of steel, he quoted, for the stars will break those of softer flesh. And in the hand of each new-made infant he placed a beaten sword, telling them, This is the truth and the way. He spat in disgust. That is their very creed. And we can do nothing? Her face was empty of expression now. I will leave you two lasers. In a year, make sure the Janshi know how to use them. I believe I know what sort of trade goods I should bring. The Janshi lived in clans as Necral thought of them, of twenty to thirty, each clan divided equally between adults and children, each having its own home forest and worship pyramid. They did not build. They slept curled up in trees around their pyramid. For food, they foraged. Juicy blue-black fruits grew everywhere, and there were three varieties of edible berries, a hallucinogenic leaf and a soapy yellow root the Janshi dug for. Necral had found them to be hunters as well, though infrequently. A clan would go for months without meat, while the snuffling brown bush hogs multiplied all around them, digging up roots and playing with the children. Then suddenly, when the bush hog population had reached some critical point, the Janshi spearmen would walk among them calmly, killing two out of every three, and that week great hog roasts would be held each night around the pyramid. Similar patterns could be discerned with the white-bodied tree slugs that sometimes covered the fruit trees like a plague until the Janshi gathered them for a stew, and with the fruit-stealing pseudo-monks that haunted the higher limbs. So far as Necral could tell, there were no predators in the forests of the Janshi. In his early months on their world, 
He had worn a long force knife and a hand laser as he walked from pyramid to pyramid on his trade route. But he had never encountered anything even remotely hostile. And now the knife lay broken in his kitchen while the laser was long lost. The day after the lights of Jolastar departed, Necral went armed into the forest again, with one of Ryther's hunting lasers slung over his shoulder. Less than two kilometers from his base, Necral found the camp of the Janshi he called the Waterfall Folk. They lived up against the side of a heavy wooded hill, where a stream of tumbling blue-white water came sliding and bouncing down, dividing and rejoining itself over and over, so the whole hillside was an intricate glittering web of waterfalls and rapids and shallow pools and spraying wet curtains. The clan's worship pyramid sat in the bottommost pool, on a flat gray stone in the middle of the eddies. Taller than most Janshi, coming up to Necral's chin, looking infinitely heavy and solid and immovable, a three-sided block of dark, dark red. Necral was not fooled. He had seen other pyramids sliced to pieces by the lasers of the steel angels and shattered by the flames of their blasters. Whatever powers the pyramids might have in Janshi myth, whatever mysteries might lie behind their origin, it was not enough to stay the swords of Bacalon. The glade around the pyramid pool was alive with sunlight when Necral entered, and the long grasses swayed in the light breeze. But most of the waterfall folk were elsewhere, in the trees, perhaps, climbing and coupling and pulling down fruits, or ranging through the forests on their hill. The trader found only a few small children riding on a bush hog in the clearing when he arrived. He sat down to wait, warm in the sunlight. Soon the old talker appeared. He sat down next to Necral, a tiny shriveled janshi, with only a few patches of dirty gray-white fur left to hide the wrinkles in his skin. He was toothless, clawless, feeble, but his eyes, wide and golden and pupilless as those of any janshi, were still alert, alive. He was the talker of the waterfall folk, the one in closest communication with the worship pyramid. Every clan had a talker. I have something new to trade, Necral said in the soft slurred speech of the Janshi. He had learned the tongue before coming here, back on Avalon. Tomas Chung, the legendary Avalonian linguist, had broken it centuries before, when the Claronimas survey brushed by this world. No other human had visited the Janshi since, but the maps of Claronimas and Chung's language pattern analysis both remained alive in the computers at the Avalon Institute for the Study of Non-Human Intelligence. We have made you more statues, have fashioned new woods, the old talker said. What have you brought, salt? Necral undid his knapsack, laid it out, and opened it. He took out one of the bricks of salt he carried and laid it before the old talker. Salt, he said, and more. He laid the hunting rifle before the Janshi. What is this? the old talker asked. Do you know of the steel angels? Necral asked. The other nodded, a gesture Necral had taught him. The godless who run from the dead valley speak of them. They are the ones who make the gods grow silent, the pyramid breakers. This is a tool like the steel angels use to break your pyramids, Necral said. I am offering it to you in trade. The old talker sat very still. But we do not wish to break pyramids, he said. This tool can be used for other things, Necral said. In time, the steel angels may come here, to break the pyramid of the waterfall folk. If by then you have tools like this, you can stop them. 
the people of the pyramid in the ring of stone tried to stop the steel angels with spears and knives. And now they are scattered and wild, and their children hang dead from the walls of the city of the steel angels. Other clans of the Janshi were unresisting, yet now they too are godless and landless. The time will come when the waterfall folk will need this tool, old talker. The Janshi elder lifted the laser and turned it curiously in his small withered hands. We must pray on this, he said. Stay, Arik. Tonight we shall tell you when the gods look down on us. Until then we shall trade. He rose abruptly, gave a swift glance at the pyramid across the pool, and faded into the forest still holding the laser. Necral sighed. He had a long wait before him. The prayer assemblies never came until sundown. He moved to the edge of the pool and unlaced his heavy boots to soak his sweaty, calloused feet in the crisp, cold waters. When he looked up, the first of the carvers had arrived. A lithe, young Janshi female with a touch of auburn in her body fur. Silent, they were all silent in Necral's presence, all save the talker, she offered him her work. It was a statuette no larger than his fist, a heavy-breasted fertility goddess fashioned out of the fragrant, thin-veined blue wood of the fruit trees. She sat cross-legged on a triangular base, and three thin slivers of bone rose from each corner of the triangle, to meet above her head in a blob of clay. Necral took the carving, turned it this way and that, and nodded his approval. The Janshi smiled and vanished, taking the salt brick with her. Long after she was gone, Necral continued to admire his acquisition. He had traded all his life, spending ten years among the squid-faced gethsoids of Oth, and four with the stick-thin Fin D, traveling a trader's circuit to a half-dozen Stone Age planets that had once been slave worlds of the broken Hrangan Empire. But nowhere had he found artists like the Janshi. Not for the first time, he wondered why neither Claranamas nor Chung had mentioned the native carvings. He was glad they hadn't, though, and fairly certain that once the dealers saw the crates of wooden gods he had sent back with Ryther, the world would be overrun by traitors. As it was, he had been sent here entirely on speculation, in hopes of finding a Janshi drug or herb or liquor that might move well in stellar trade. Instead, he'd found the art, like an answer to a prayer. Other workmen came and went, as the morning turned to afternoon and the afternoon to dusk, setting their craft before him. He looked over each piece carefully, taking some and declining others, paying for what he took in salt. Before full darkness had descended, a small pile of goods sat by his right hand, a matched set of redstone knives, a gray death cloth woven from the fur of an elderly Janshi by his widow and friends, with his face wrought upon it in the silky golden hairs of a pseudo-monk, a bone spear with tracings that reminded Necral of the runes of old earth legend, and statues. The statues were his favorites always. So often alien art was alien beyond comprehension, but the Janshi workmen touched emotional chords in him. The gods they carved, each sitting in a bone pyramid, wore Janshi faces, yet at the same time seemed archetypically human. Stern-faced war gods, things that looked oddly like satyrs, fertility goddesses, like the one he had bought, almost man-like warriors and nymphs. Often Necral had wished that he had a formal education in XT anthropology, so that he might write a book on the universals of myth. The Janshi surely had a rich mythology, though the talkers never spoke of it. Nothing else could explain the carvings. 
Perhaps the old gods were no longer worshipped, but they were still remembered. By the time the heart of Bacalon went down, and the last reddish rays ceased to filter through the looming trees, Necral had gathered as much as he could carry, and his salt was all but exhausted. He laced up his boots again, packed his acquisitions with painstaking care, and sat patiently in the poolside grass, waiting. One by one, the waterfall folk joined him. Finally, the old talker returned. The prayers began. The old talker, with the laser still in his hand, waded carefully across the night-dark waters to squat by the black bulk of the pyramid. The others, adults and children together, now some forty strong, chose spots in the grass near the banks, behind Necral and around him. Like him, they looked out over the pool, at the pyramid and the talker, outlined clearly in the light of a new-risen, oversized moon. Setting the laser down on the stone, the old talker pressed both palms flat against the side of the pyramid, and his body seemed to go stiff, while all the other she also tensed and grew very quiet. Necral shifted restlessly and fought a yawn. It was not the first time he'd sat through a prayer ritual, and he knew the routine. A good hour of boredom lay before him. The Janshi did silent worship, and there was nothing to be heard but their steady breathing, nothing to be seen but forty impassive faces. Sighing, the trader tried to relax, closing his eyes and concentrating on the soft grass beneath him and the warm breeze that tossed his wild mane of hair. Here, briefly, he found peace. How long would it last, he mused, should the steel angels leave their valley? The hour passed, but Necral, lost in meditation, scarce felt the flow of time, until suddenly he heard the rustlings and chatter around him as the waterfall folk rose and went back into the forest. And then the old talker stood in front of him and laid the laser at his feet. No, he said simply. Necral started. What? But you must. Let me show you what it can do. I have had a vision, Arik. The god has shown me. But also he has shown me that it would not be a good thing to take this in trade. Old talker, the steel angels will come if they come. Our god shall speak to them, the Janshi elder said in his purring speech. But there was finality in the gentle voice, and no appeal in the vast liquid eyes. For our food we thank ourselves, none other. It is ours because we worked for it, ours because we fought for it, ours by the only right that is, the right of the strong. But for that strength, for the might of our arms, and the steel of our swords, and the fire in our hearts, we thank Bacalon, the pale child, who gave us life and taught us how to keep it. The proctor stood stiffly at the centermost of the five long wooden tables that stretched the length of the great mess hall, pronouncing each word of the grace with solemn dignity. His large, veined hands pressed tightly together as he spoke against the flat of the upward jutting sword, and the dim lights had faded his uniform to an almost black. Around him, the steel angels sat at attention, their food untouched before them. Fat boiled tubers, steaming chunks of bush hog meat, black bread, bowls of crunchy green neo-grass. Children below the fighting age of ten, in smocks of starchy white and the omnipresent mesh steel belts, filled the two outermost tables beneath the slit-like windows. Toddlers struggled to sit still under the watchful eyes of stern nine-year-old house parents with hardwood batons in their belts. 
Farther in, the fighting brotherhood sat, fully armed, at two equally long tables, men and women alternating, leather-skinned veterans sitting next to ten-year-olds who had barely moved from the children's dorm to the barracks. All of them wore the same chameleon cloth as Wyatt, though without his collar, and a few had buttons of rank. The center table, less than half the length of the others, held the cadre of the Steel Angels, the squad fathers and squad mothers, the weapons masters, the healers, the four field bishops, all those who wore the high, stiff, crimson collar, and the proctor at its head. Let us eat, Wyatt said at last. His sword moved above his table with a whoosh, describing the slash of blessing, and he sat to his meal. The proctor, like all the others, had stood single file in the line that wound past the kitchen to the mess hall, and his portions were no larger than the least of the brotherhood. There was a clink of knives and forks, and the infrequent clatter of a plate, and from time to time the thwack of a baton, as a house parent punished some transgression of discipline by one of his charges. Other than that, the hall was silent. The Steel Angels did not speak at meals, but rather meditated on the lessons of the day as they consumed their Spartan fare. Afterwards, the children, still silent, marched out of the hall back to their dormitory. The Fighting Brotherhood followed, some to chapel, most to the barracks, a few to guard duty on the walls. The men they were relieving would find late meals still warm in the kitchen. The officer corps remained. After the plates were cleared away, the meal became a staff meeting. At ease, Wyatt said, but the figures along the table relaxed little, if at all. Relaxation had been bred out of them by now. The proctor found one of them with his eyes. Dallas, he said, you have the report I requested? Field Bishop Dallas nodded. She was a husky middle-aged woman with thick muscles and skin the color of brown leather. On her collar was a small steel insignia, an ornamental memory chip that meant computer services. Yes, Proctor, she said in a hard, precise voice. Jameson's world is a fourth-generation colony, settled mostly from old Poseidon, one large continent, almost entirely unexplored, and more than 12,000 islands of various sizes. The human population is concentrated almost entirely on the islands, and makes its living by farming sea and land, aquatic husbandry, and heavy industry. The oceans are rich in food and metal. The total population is about 79 million. There are two large cities, both with spaceports, Port Jameson, and Jolistar. She looked down at the computer printout on the table. Jameson's world was not even charted at the time of the double war. It has never known military action, and the only Jamie armed forces are their planetary police. It has no colonial program, and has never attempted to claim political jurisdiction beyond its own atmosphere. The proctor nodded. Excellent. Then the trader's threat to report us is essentially an empty one. We can proceed. Squad Father Wallman? Four Janshi were taken today, Proctor, and are now on the walls, Wallman reported. He was a ruddy young man with a blonde crew cut and large ears. If I might, sir, I would request discussion of possible termination of the campaign. Each day we search harder for less. We have virtually wiped out every Janshi youngling of the clans who originally inhabited Sword Valley. Wyatt nodded. Other opinions? Field Bishop Lyon, blue-eyed and gaunt, indicated dissent. The adults remain alive. The mature beast 
He's more dangerous than the youngling, squad father. Not in this case, weapons master Kara Dahan said. Dahan was a giant of a man, bald and bronze-colored, the chief of psychological weaponry and enemy intelligence. Our studies show that once the pyramid is destroyed, neither full-grown Janshi nor the immature pose any threat whatsoever to the children of Bacalon. Their social structure virtually disintegrates. The adults either flee, hoping to join some other clan, or revert to near-animal savagery. They abandon the younglings, most of whom fend for themselves in a confused sort of way, and offer no resistance when we take them. Considering the number of Janshi on our walls, and those reported slain by predators or each other, I strongly feel that Sword Valley is virtually clean of the animals. Winter is coming, Proctor, and much must be done. Squad Father Wallman and his men should be set to other tasks. There was more discussion, but the tone had been set. Most of the speakers backed Dahan. Wyatt listened carefully, and all the while prayed to Bacalon for guidance. Finally, he motioned for quiet. Squad Father, he said to Wallman, Tomorrow collect all the Janshi, both adults and children, that you can. But do not hang them if they are unresisting. Instead, take them to the city and show them their clanmates on our walls. Then cast them from the valley, one in each direction of the compass. He bowed his head. It is my hope that they will carry a message to all the Janshi, of the price that must be paid when a beast raises hand or claw or blade against the seed of earth. Then, when the spring comes and the children of Bacalon move beyond Sword Valley, the Janshi will peacefully abandon their pyramids and quit whatever lands men may require, so the glory of the pale child might be spread. Lion and Dahan both nodded, among others. Speak wisdom to us, Field Bishop Dallas said then. Proctor Wyatt agreed. One of the lesser-ranking squad mothers brought him the book, and he opened it to the chapter of teachings. In those days, much evil had come upon the seed of earth, the proctor read, for the children of Bacalon had abandoned him to bow to softer gods. So their skies grew dark, and upon them from above came the sons of Ranga, with red eyes and demon teeth, and upon them from below came the vast horde of Findi like a cloud of locusts that blotted out the stars. And the worlds flamed, and the children cried out, Save us! Save us! And the pale child came and stood before them, with his great sword in his hand, and in a voice like thunder he rebuked them. You have been weak, children, he told them, for you have disobeyed. Where are your swords? Did I not set swords in your hands? And the children cried out, We have beaten them into plowshares, O Bacalon. And he was sore angry. With plowshares, then, shall you face the sons of Ranga? With plowshares shall you slay the horde of Findi? And he left them, and heard no more their weeping. For the heart of Bacalon is a heart of fire, but then one among the seed of earth dried his tears, for the skies did burn so bright that they ran scalding on his cheeks, and the bloodlust rose in him, and he beat his plowshare back into a sword and charged the sons of Ranga, slaying as he went. The others saw and followed, 
and a great battle cry rang across the worlds. And the pale child heard, and came again, for the sound of battle is more pleasing to his ears than the sound of wails. And when he saw, he smiled. Now you are my children again, he said to the seed of earth, for you had turned against me to worship a god who calls himself a lamb. But did you not know that lambs go only to the slaughter? Yet now your eyes have cleared, and again you are the wolves of God. And Bacalon gave them all swords again, all his children and all the seed of earth, and he lifted his great black blade, the demon reaver that slays the soulless, and swung it. And the sons of Hranga fell before his might, and the great horde that was the Findi burned beneath his gaze, and the children of Bacalon swept across the worlds. The proctor lifted his eyes. Go, my brothers in arms, and think on the teachings of Bacalon as you sleep. May the pale child grant you visions. They were dismissed. The trees on the hill were bare and glazed with ice, and the snow, unbroken except for their footsteps and the stirrings of the bitter sharp north wind, gleamed a blinding white in the noon sun. In the valley beneath, the city of the steel angels looked preternaturally clean and still. Great snowdrifts had piled against the eastern walls, climbing halfway up the stark scarlet stone. The gates had not opened in months. Long ago, the children of Bacalon had taken their harvest and fallen back inside the city to huddle around their fires. But for the blue lights that burned late into the cold black night and the occasional guard pacing atop the walls, Necral would hardly have known that the angels still lived. The Janshi that Necral had come to think of as the bitter speaker looked at him out of eyes curiously darker than the soft gold of her brothers. Below the snow, the god lies broken, she said, and even the soothing tones of the Janshi tongue could not hide the hardness in her voice. They stood at the very spot where Necral had once taken Rither the spot where the pyramid of the people of the Ring of Stone once stood. Necral was sheathed head to foot in a white thermosuit that clung too tightly, accenting every unsightly bulge. He looked out on Sword Valley from behind a dark blue plastifilm in the suit's cowl. But the Janshi, the bitter speaker, was nude, covered only by the thick gray fur of her winter coat. The strap of the hunting laser ran down between her breasts. Other gods besides yours will break unless the steel angels are stopped, Necral said, shivering despite his thermosuit. The bitter speaker seemed hardly to hear. I was a child when they came, Arik. If they had left our god, I might be a child still. Afterwards, when the light went out and the glow inside me died, I wandered far from the Ring of Stone, beyond our own home forest, knowing nothing, eating where I could. Things are not the same in the dark valley. Bushogs honked at my passing and charged me with their tusks, other Janshi threatened me and each other. I did not understand, and I could not pray. Even when the steel angels found me, I did not understand, and I went with them to their city, knowing nothing of their speech. I remember the walls, and the children, many so much younger than me. Then I screamed and struggled, 
when I saw those on the ropes, something wild and godless stirred to life inside me. Her eyes regarded him, her eyes like burnished bronze. She shifted in the ankle-deep snow, curling a clawed hand around the strap of her laser. Necral had taught her well since the day she had joined him. In the late summer, when the Steel Angels had cast her from Sword Valley, the bitter speaker was by far the best shot of his six, the godless exiles he had gathered to him and trained. It was the only way. He had offered the lasers in trade to clan after clan, and each had refused. The Janshi were certain that their gods would protect them. Only the godless listened and not all of them. Many, the young children, the quiet ones, the first to flee, many had been accepted into other clans. But others, like the bitter speaker, had grown too savage, had seen too much. They fit no longer. She had been the first to take the weapon, after the old talker had sent her away from the waterfall folk. It is often better to be without gods, Nekral told her. Those below us have a god, and it has made them what they are. And so the Janshi have gods, and because they trust, they die. You godless are their only hope. The bitter speaker did not answer. She only looked down on the silent city, besieged by snow, and her eyes smoldered and Necral watched her and wondered. He and his six were the hope of the Janshi, he had said. If so, was there hope at all? The bitter speaker and all his exiles had a madness about them, a rage that made him tremble. Even if Ryther came with the lasers, even if so small a group could stop the angels' march, even if all that came to pass— what then? Should all the angels die tomorrow, where would his godless find a place? They stood, all quiet, while the snow stirred under their feet, and the north wind bit at them. The chapel was dark and quiet. Flame globes burned a dim, eerie red in either corner, and the rows of plain wooden benches were empty. Above the heavy altar, a slab of rough black stone, Bacalon stood in hologram, so real he almost breathed. A boy, a mere boy, naked and milky white, with the wide eyes and blonde hair of innocent youth. In his hand, half again taller than himself, was the great black sword. Wyatt knelt before the projection head bowed and very still. All through the winter, his dreams had been dark and troubled, so each day he would kneel and pray for guidance. There was none else to seek but Bacalon. He, Wyatt, was the proctor, who led in battle and in faith. He alone must riddle his visions. So daily he wrestled with his thoughts, until the snows began to melt and the knees of his uniform had nearly worn through from long scraping on the floor. Finally, he had decided, and this day he had called upon the senior collars to join him in the chapel. Alone they entered, while the proctor knelt unmoving, and chose seats on the benches behind him, each apart from his fellows. Wyatt took no notice. He prayed only that his words would be correct, his vision true. When they were all there, he stood and turned to face them. Many are the worlds on which the children of Bacalon have lived, he told them, but none so blessed as this, our Corlos. A great time is on us, my brothers in arms, the pale child has come to me in my sleep, 
as once he came to the first proctors, in the years when the brotherhood was forged, he has given me visions. They were quiet, all of them, their eyes humble and obedient. He was their proctor, after all. There could be no questioning when one of higher rank spoke wisdom or gave orders. That was one of the precepts of Bacalon, that the chain of command was sacred and never to be doubted. So all of them kept silence. Bacalon himself has walked upon this world. He has walked among the soulless and the beasts of the field, and told them our dominion. And this he has said to me, that when the spring comes, and the seed of earth moves from Sword Valley to take new land, all the animals shall know their place, and retire before us. This I do prophesy. More, we shall see miracles. That, too, the pale child has promised me, signs by which we will know his truth, signs that shall bolster our faith with new revelation. But so, too, shall our faith be tested, for it will be a time of sacrifices, and Bacalon will call upon us more than once to show our trust in him. We must remember his teachings and be true, and each of us must obey him as a child obeys the parent, and a fighting man his officer, that is, swiftly and without question. For the pale child knows best. These are the visions he has granted me. These are the dreams that I have dreamed. Brothers, pray with me. And Wyatt turned again and knelt, and the rest knelt with him, and all the heads were bowed in prayer save one. In the shadows at the rear of the chapel, where the flame globes flickered but dimly, Kara Dahan stared at his proctor from beneath a heavy beetled brow. That night, after a silent meal in the mess hall and a short staff meeting, the weapons master called upon Wyatt to go walking on the walls. Proctor, my soul is troubled, he told him. I must have counsel from he who is closest to Bacalon. Wyatt nodded, and both donned heavy night cloaks of black fur and oil dark metal cloth, and together they walked the redstone parapets beneath the stars. Near the guardhouse that stood above the city gates, Dahan paused and leaned out over the ledge, his eyes searching the slow-melting snow for long moments before he turned them on the proctor. Wyatt, he said at last, my faith is weak. The proctor said nothing, merely watched the other, his face concealed by the hood of his nightcloak. Confession was not a part of the rites of the Steel Angels. Bacalon had said that a fighting man's faith ought never to waver. In the old days, Kara Dahan was saying, many weapons were used against the children of Bacalon. Some today exist only in tales. Perhaps they never existed. Perhaps they are empty things like the gods the soft men worship. I am only a weapons master. Such knowledge is not mine. Yet there is a tale, my proctor, one that troubles me. Once, it is said, in the long centuries of war, the sons of Hranga loosed upon the seed of earth foul vampires of the mind, the creatures men called soul socks. Their touch was invisible, but it crept across kilometers, farther than a man could see, farther than a laser could fire, 
and it brought madness. Visions, my proctor. Visions. False gods and foolish plans were put in the minds of men. And silence, Wyatt said. His voice was hard, as cold as the night air that crackled around them, and turned his breath to steam. There was a long pause. Then, in a softer voice, the proctor continued. All winter I have prayed to Han and struggled with my visions. I am the proctor of the children of Bacalon on the world of Corlos, not some new armed child to be lied to by false gods. I spoke only after I was sure. I spoke as your proctor, as your father in faith and your commanding officer, that you would question me, weapons master, that you would doubt. This disturbs me greatly. Next, will you stop to argue with me on the field of battle, to dispute some fine point of my orders? Never, Proctor, Dahan said, kneeling in penance in the packed snow atop the walkway. I hope not. But before I dismiss you, because you are my brother in Bacalon, I will answer you, though I need not, and it was wrong of you to expect it. I will tell you this. The Proctor Wyatt is a good officer, as well as a devout man. The pale child has made prophecies to me, and has predicted that miracles will come to pass. All these things we shall see with our very eyes. But if the prophecies should fail us, and if no signs appear, well, our eyes will see that too. And then I will know that it was not Bacalon who sent the visions, but only a false god, perhaps a soul suck of Hranga. Or do you think a Hrangan can work miracles? No, Dahan said, still on his knees, his great bald head downcast. That would be heresy. Indeed said Wyatt. The proctor glanced briefly beyond the walls. The night was crisp and cold, and there was no moon. He felt transfigured, and even the stars seemed to cry the glory of the pale child, for the constellation of the sword was high upon the zenith, the soldier reaching up toward it from where he stood on the horizon. Tonight you will walk guard without your cloak, the proctor told Dahan when he looked down again. And should the north wind blow, and the cold bite at you, you will rejoice in the pain, for it will be a sign that you submit to your proctor and your god. As your flesh grows bitter numb, the flame in your heart must burn hotter. Yes, my proctor, Dahan said. He stood and removed his nightcloak, handing it to the other. Wyatt gave him the slash of blessing. On the wall screen in his darkened living quarters, the taped drama went through its familiar measured paces, but Necral, slouched in a large cushioned recliner with his eyes half closed, hardly noticed. The bitter speaker and two of the other Janshi exiles sat on the floor, golden eyes wrapped on the spectacle of humans chasing and shooting each other amid the vaulting tower cities of I. Emerald. Increasingly, they had begun to grow curious about other worlds and other ways of life. It was all very strange. Nekral thought. The waterfall folk and the other clanned Janshi had never shown any such interest. 
he remembered the early days, before the coming of the steel angels in their ancient and soon-to-be-dismantled warship, when he had set all kinds of trade goods before the Janshi talkers, bright bolts of glitter silk from Avalon, glowstone jewelry from High Cavalon, duraloy knives and solar generators and steel power bows, books from a dozen worlds, medicines and wines. He had come with a little of everything. The talkers took some of it from time to time, but never with any enthusiasm. The only offering that excited them was salt. It was not until the spring rains came and the bitter speaker began to question him that Necral realized with a start how seldom any of the Janshi clans had ever asked him anything. Perhaps their social structure and their religion stifled their natural intellectual curiosity. The exiles were certainly eager enough, especially the bitter speaker. Necral could answer only a small portion of her questions of late, and even then she always had new ones to puzzle him with. He had begun to grow appalled with the extent of his own ignorance. But then so had the bitter speaker. Unlike the clan, Janshi, did the religion make that much difference? She would answer questions as well, and Necral had tried quizzing her on many things that he'd wondered at. But most of the time, she would only blink in bafflement and begin to question herself. There are no stories about our gods, she said to him once, when he'd tried to learn a little of Janshi myth. What sort of stories could there be? The gods live in the worship pyramids, Arik, and we pray to them, and they watch over us and light our lives. They do not bounce around and fight and break each other, like your gods seem to do. But you had other gods once, before you came to worship the pyramids, Necral objected. The very ones your carvers did for me. He had even gone so far as to unpack a crate and show her, though surely she remembered, since the people of the pyramid in the Ring of Stone had been among the finest craftsmen. Yet the bitter speaker only smoothed her fur and shook her head. I was too young to be a carver, so perhaps I was not told, she said. We all know that which we need to know, but only the carvers need to do these things, so perhaps only they know the stories of these old gods. Another time he had asked her about the pyramids, and had gotten even less. Build them, she had said. We did not build them, Arik. They have always been, like the rocks and the trees. But then she blinked. But they are not like the rocks and the trees, are they? And puzzled, she went away to talk to the others. But if the godless Janshi were more thoughtful than their brothers in the clans, they were also more difficult, and each day Necral realized more and more the futility of their enterprise. He had eight of the exiles with him now. They had found two more, half dead from starvation in the height of winter, and they all took turns training with the two lasers and spying on the angels. But even should Ryther return with the weaponry, their force was a joke against the might the proctor could put in the field. The lights of Jolastar would be carrying a full arms shipment in the expectation that every clan, for a hundred kilometers, would now be roused and angry, ready to resist the Steel Angels and overwhelm them by sheer force of numbers. Janus would be blank-faced, when only Necral and his ragged band appeared to greet her. If, in fact, they did, even that was problematical. He was having much difficulty keeping his guerrillas together. Their hatred of the Steel Angels still bordered on madness, but they were far from a cohesive unit, 
None of them liked to take orders very well, and they fought constantly, going at each other with bared claws in struggles for social dominance. If Necral had not warned them, he suspected they might even duel with the lasers. As for staying in good fighting shape, that too was a joke. Of the three females in the band, the bitter speaker was the only one who had not allowed herself to be impregnated. Since the gen she usually gave birth in litters of four to eight, Necral calculated that late summer would present them with an exile population explosion, and there would be more after that, he knew. The godless seemed to copulate almost hourly, and there was no such thing as Janshi birth control. He wondered how the clans kept their population so stable, but his charges didn't know that either. I suppose we sexed less, the bitter speaker said when he asked her. But I was a child, so I would not really know. Before I came here, there was never the urge. I was just young, I would think. But when she said it, she scratched herself and seemed very unsure. Sighing, Necral eased himself back in the recliner and tried to shut out the noise of the wall screen. It was all going to be very difficult. Already the steel angels had emerged from behind their walls, and the power wagons rolled up and down Sword Valley, turning forest into farmland. He had gone up into the hills himself, and it was easy to see that the spring planting would soon be done. Then, he suspected, the children of Bacalon would try to expand. Just last week, one of them, a giant with no head fur, as his scout had described him, was seen up in the ring of stone gathering shards from the broken pyramid. Whatever that meant, it could not be for the good. Sometimes he felt sick at the forces he had set in motion, and almost wished that Rither would forget the lasers. The bitter speaker was determined to strike as soon as they were armed, no matter what the odds. Frightened, Necral reminded her of the hard angel lesson the last time a Janshi had killed a man. In his dreams, he still saw children on the walls. But she only looked at him, with the bronze tinge of madness in her eyes, and said, Yes, Arik, I remember. Silent and efficient, the white-smocked kitchen boys cleared away the last of the evening's dishes and vanished. At ease, Wyatt said to his officers. Then, the time of miracles is upon us, as the pale child foretold. This morning, I sent three squads into the hills to the southeast of Sword Valley to disperse the Janshi clans on lands that we require. They reported back to me in early afternoon, and now I wish to share their reports with you. Squad Mother Jolip, will you relate the events that transpired when you carried out your orders? Yes, Proctor. Jolip stood, a white-skinned blonde with a pinched face, her uniform hanging slightly loose on a lean body. I was assigned a squad of ten to clear out the so-called Cliff Clan, whose pyramid lies near the foot of a low granite cliff in the wilder part of the hills. The information provided by our intelligence indicated that they were one of the smaller clans, with only twenty-odd adults. So I dispensed with heavy armor. We did take a Class V blast cannon, since the destruction of the Janshi pyramids is slow work with sidearms alone. But other than that, our armament was strictly standard issue. We expected no resistance, but recalling the incident at the Ring of Stone, I was cautious. After a march of some twelve kilometers through the hills to the vicinity of the cliff, we fanned out in a semicircle and moved in slowly, with screech guns drawn. A few Janshi were encountered in the forest, 
and these we took prisoner, and marched before us, for use as shields in the event of an ambush or attack. That, of course, proved unnecessary. When we reached the pyramid by the cliff, they were waiting for us. At least twelve of the beasts, sir. One of them sat near the base of the pyramid, with his hands pressed against its side, while the others surrounded him in a sort of a circle. They all looked up at us, but made no other move. She paused a minute and rubbed a thoughtful finger up against the side of her nose. As I told the proctor, it was all very odd from that point forward. Last summer I twice led squads against the Janshi clans. The first time, having no idea of our intentions, none of the soulless were there. We simply destroyed the artifact and left. The second time, a crowd of the creatures milled around, hampering us with their bodies, while not being actively hostile. They did not disperse until I had one of them screeched down. And of course, I studied the reports of Squad Father Alor's difficulties at the Ring of Stone. This time, it was all quite different. I ordered two of my men to set the blast cannon on its tripod, and gave the beasts to understand that they must get out of the way. With hand signals, of course, since I know none of their ungodly tongue. They complied at once, splitting into two groups, and, well, lining up on either side of the line of fire. We kept them covered with our screech guns, of course, but everything seemed very peaceful. And so it was. The blaster took the pyramid out neatly. A big ball of flame and then sort of a thunder as the thing exploded. A few shards were scattered, but no one was injured, as we had all taken cover, and the Janshi seemed unconcerned. After the pyramid broke, there was a sharp ozone smell, and for an instant a lingering bluish fire, perhaps an afterimage. I hardly had time to notice them, however, since that was when the Janshi all fell to their knees before us. All at once, sirs. And then they pressed their heads against the ground, prostrating themselves. I thought for a moment that they were trying to hail us as gods, because we had shattered their god, and I tried to tell them that we wanted none of their animal worship, and required only that they leave these lands at once but then I saw that I had misunderstood, because that was when the other four clan members came forward from the trees atop the cliff and climbed down and gave us the statue. Then the rest got up. The last I saw, the entire clan was walking due east, away from Sword Valley and the outlying hills. I took the statue and brought it back to the proctor. She fell silent, but remained standing, waiting for questions. I have the statuette here, Wyatt said. He reached down beside his chair and set it on the table, then pulled off the white cloth covering he had wrapped around it. The base was a triangle of rock-hard black bark, and three long splinters of bone rose from the corners to make a pyramid frame, within, exquisitely carved in every detail from soft blue wood, Bacalon, the pale child, stood, holding a painted sword. What does this mean? Field Bishop Lyon asked, obviously startled. Sacrilege, Field Bishop Dallas said. Nothing so serious, said Gorman, field bishop for heavy armor. The beasts are simply trying to ingratiate themselves, perhaps in the hope that we will stay our swords. None but the seed of earth may bow to Bacalon, Dallas said. It is written in the book. The pale child will not look with favor on the soulless. Silence, my brothers in arms the proctor said, and the long table abruptly grew quiet again. 
Wyatt smiled a thin smile. This is the first of the miracles of which I spoke this winter in the chapel. The first of the strange happenings that Bacalan told to me. For truly he has walked this world, our Corlos, so even the beasts of the fields know his likeness. Think on it, my brothers. Think on this carving. Ask yourselves a few simple questions. Have any of the Janshi animals ever been permitted to set foot in this holy city? No, of course not, someone said. Then clearly, none of them have seen the holograph that stands above our altar. Nor have I often walked among the beasts, as my duties keep me here within the walls. So none could have seen the pale child's likeness on the chain of office that I wear, for the few Janshi who have seen my visage have not lived to speak of it. They were those I judged, who hung upon our city walls. The animals do not speak the language of the earth seed, nor have any among us learned their simple beastly tongue. Lastly, they have not read the book. Remember all this, and wonder, how did their carvers know what face and form to carve? Quiet. The leaders of the children of Bacalon looked back and forth among themselves in wonderment. Wyatt quietly folded his hands. A miracle. We shall have no more trouble with the Janshi, for the pale child has come to them. To the proctor's right, Field Bishop Dallas sat rigidly. My proctor, my leader in faith, she said with some difficulty, each word coming slowly. Surely, surely you do not mean to tell us that these, these animals, that they can worship the pale child, that he accepts their worship. Wyatt seemed calm, benevolent. He only smiled. You need not trouble your soul, Dallas. You wonder whether I commit the first fallacy, remembering perhaps the sacrilege of Gra, when a captive Frangin bowed to Bacalon to save himself from an animal's death and the false proctor Gibron proclaimed that all who worship the pale child must have souls. He shook his head. You see, I read the book. But no, Field Bishop, no sacrilege has transpired. Bacalon has walked among the Janshi, but surely has given them only truth. They have seen him, in all his armed dark glory, and heard him proclaim that they are animals, without souls, as surely he would proclaim. Accordingly, they accept their place in the order of the universe, and retire before us. They will never kill a man again. Recall that they did not bow to the statue they carved, but rather gave the statue to us, the seed of earth, who alone can rightfully worship it. When they did prostrate themselves, it was at our feet, as animals to men. And that is as it should be. You see, they have been given truth. Dallas was nodding. Yes, my proctor. I am enlightened. Forgive my moment of weakness. But halfway down the table, Kara Dahan leaned forward and knotted his great knuckled hands, frowning all the while. My proctor, he said heavily. Weapons, master. Wyatt returned. His face grew stern. Like the field bishop, 
my soul has flickered briefly with worry, and I too would be enlightened if I might. Wyatt smiled. Proceed, he said in a voice without humor. A miracle this thing may be indeed, Dahan said. But first we must question ourselves, to ascertain that it is not the trick of a soulless enemy. I do not fathom their stratagem, or their reasons for acting as they have. But I do know of one way that the Janshi might have learned the features of our Bacalon. Oh? I speak of the Jamish trading base and the red-haired trader Arik Nekral. He is an Earthseed, an Emirelli by his looks, and we have given him the book. But he remains without a burning love of Bacalon, and goes without arms like a godless man. Since our landing he has opposed us, and he grew most hostile after the lesson we were forced to give the Janshi. Perhaps he put the Cliff Clan up to it, told them to do the carving, to some strange ends of his own. I believe that he did trade with them. I believe you speak truth, Weapons Master. In the early months after landing, I tried hard to convert Nekral, to no avail, but I did learn much of the Janshi beasts, and of the trading he did with them. The proctor still smiled. He traded with one of the clans here in Sword Valley, with the people of Ring of Stone, with the Cliff Clan, and that of the Far Fruit Tangle, with the Waterfall Folk, and sundry clans farther east. Then it is his doing, Dahan said. A trick. All eyes moved to Wyatt. I did not say that. Necral, whatever intentions he might have, is but a single man. He did not trade with all the Janshi, nor even know them all. The proctor's smile grew briefly wider. Those of you who have seen the Emirelli know him for a man of flab and weakness. He could hardly walk as far as might be required, and he has neither air car nor power sled. But he did have contact with the Cliff Clan, Dahan said. The deep graven lines on his bronze forehead were set stubbornly. Yes, he did, Wyatt answered. But Squad Mother Jolip did not go forth alone this morning. I also sent out Squad Father Wallman and Squad Father Alor to cross the waters of the White Knife. The land there is dark and fertile, better than that to the east. The Cliff Clan, who are southeast, were between Sword Valley and the White Knife, so they had to go. But the other pyramids we moved against belonged to Far River Clans, more than thirty kilometers south. They have never seen the trader Arik Nekral, unless he has grown wings this winter. Then Wyatt bent again, and set two more statues on the table, and pulled away their coverings. One was set on a base of slate, and the figure was carved in a clumsy, broad manner. The other was finely detailed soap root, even to the struts of the pyramid but except for the materials and the workmanship, the later statues were identical to the first. Do you see a trick, weapons master? Wyatt asked. Dahan looked and said nothing, for Field Bishop Lyon rose suddenly and said, I see a miracle, and others echoed him. After the hubbub had finally quieted, the brawny weapons master lowered his head and said very softly, My proctor, read wisdom 
to us. The lasers, speaker! The lasers! There was a tinge of hysterical desperation in Necral's tone. Rither is not back yet, and that is the very point. We must wait. He stood outside the bubble of the trading base, bare-chested and sweating in the hot morning sun, with the thick wind tugging at his tangled hair. The clamor had pulled him from a troubled sleep. He had stopped them just on the edge of the forest, and now the bitter speaker had turned to face him, looking fierce and hard and most ungenshi like with the laser slung across her shoulders, a bright blue glitter silk scarf knotted around her neck, and fat glowstone rings on all eight of her fingers. The other exiles, but for the two that were heavy with child, stood around her. One of them held the other laser, the rest carried quivers and power bows. That had been the speaker's idea. Her newly chosen mate was down on one knee, panting, he had run all the way from the Ring of Stone. No, Arik, the speaker said, eyes bronze angry. Your lasers are now a month overdue, by your own count of time. Each day we wait, and the steel angels smash more pyramids. Soon they may hang children again. Very soon... Necral said, Very soon if you attack them. Where is your very hope of victory? Your watcher says they go with two squads and a power wagon. Can you stop them with a pair of lasers and four power bows? Have you learned to think here or not? Yes, the speaker said, but she bared her teeth at him as she said it. Yes. But that cannot matter. The clans do not resist, so we must. From one knee, her mate looked up at Necral. They... they march on the waterfall, he said, still breathing heavily. The waterfall, the bitter speaker repeated. Since the death of winter... They have broken more than twenty pyramids, Arik, and their power wagons have crushed the forest, and now a great dusty road scars the soil from their valley to the riverlands. But they had hurt no Janshi yet this season. They had let them go, and all those clans without a god have gone to the waterfall, until the home forest of the waterfall folk is bare and eaten clean. Their talkers sit with the old talker, and perhaps the waterfall god takes them in. Perhaps he is a very great god. I do not know these things, but I do know that now the bald angel has learned of the twenty clans together, of a grouping of half a thousand Janshi adults, and he leads a power wagon against them. Will he let them go so easy this time, happy with a carved statue? Will they go, Arik? Will they give up a second god as easily as a first? The speaker blinked. I fear they will resist with their silly claws. I fear the bald angel will hang them even if they do not resist because so many in union throws suspicion in him. I fear many things, and know little, but I know we must be there. You will not stop us, Arik, and we cannot wait for your long late lasers. And she turned to the others and said, Come, we must run. And they had faded into the forest, before Necral could even shout for them to stay. Swearing, he turned back to the bubble. The two female exiles were leaving just as he entered. Both were close to the end of their term, but they had power bows in their hands. Necral stopped short. You too? he said furiously, glaring at them. Madness! 
It is the very stuff of madness. They only looked at him with silent, golden eyes and moved past him toward the trees. Inside, he swiftly braided his long red hair so it would not catch on the branches, slipped into a shirt, and darted toward the door. Then he stopped. A weapon. He must have a weapon. He glanced around frantically and ran heavily for his storeroom. The power bows were all gone, he saw. What then? What? He began to rummage, and finally settled for a Duraloy machete. It felt strange in his hand, and he must have looked most unmartial and ridiculous, but somehow he felt he must take something. Then he was off, toward the place of the waterfall folk. Necral was overweight and soft, hardly used to running, and the way was nearly two kilometers through lush summer forest. He had to stop three times to rest and quiet the pains in his chest, and it seemed an eternity before he arrived. But still he beat the steel angels. A power wagon is ponderous and slow, and the road from Sword Valley was longer and more hilly. Janshi were everywhere. The glade was bare of grass, and twice as large as Nekral remembered it from his last trading trip early that spring. Still, the Janshi filled all of it, sitting on the ground, staring at the pool and the waterfall, all silent, packed together so there was scarcely room to walk among them. More sat above, a dozen in every fruit tree, some of the children even ascending to the higher limbs where the pseudo-monks usually ruled alone. On the rock at the center of the pool, with the waterfall behind them as a backdrop, the talkers pressed around the pyramid of the waterfall folk. They were closer together than even those in the grass, and each had his palms flat against the sides. One, thin and frail, sat on the shoulders of another so that he too might touch. Necral tried to count them and gave up. The group was too dense, a blurred mass of gray-furred arms and golden eyes, the pyramid at their center, dark and unmovable as ever. The bitter speakers stood in the pool, the waters ankle-deep around her. She was facing the crowd and screeching at them, her voice strangely unlike the usual Janshi purr. In her scarf and rings, she looked absurdly out of place. As she talked, she waved the laser rifle she was holding in one hand. Wildly, passionately, hysterically, she was telling the gathered Janshi that the steel angels were coming, that they must leave at once, that they should break up and go into the forest and regroup at the trading base. Over and over again she said it. But the clans were stiff and silent. No one answered. No one listened. No one heard. In full daylight, they were praying. Necral pushed his way through them, stepping on a hand here and a foot there, hardly able to set down a boot without crunching Janshi flesh. He was standing next to the bitter speaker, who still gestured wildly, before her bronze eyes seemed to see him. Then she stopped. Arik, she said, the angels are coming, and they will not listen. The others, he panted, still short on breath. Where are they? The trees, the bitter speaker replied with a vague gesture. I sent them up in the trees. Snipers, Arik, such as we saw upon your wall. Please, he said, come back with me. Leave them. Leave them. You told them. I told them. Whatever happens, it is their doing. It is the fault of their fool religion. I cannot leave, the bitter speaker said. She seemed confused, as so often when Necral had questioned her back at the base. It seems I should, but somehow I know I must stay here and the others will never go, even if I did. 
They feel it much more strongly. We must be here. To fight. To talk. She blinked. I do not know why, Arik, but we must. And before the trader could reply, the steel angels came out of the forest. There were five of them at first, widely spaced, then shortly five more, all afoot, in uniforms whose mottled dark greens blended with the leaves, so that only the glitter of the mesh steel belts and matching battle helmets stood out. One of them, a gaunt pale woman, wore a high red collar. All of them had hand lasers drawn. You! the blonde woman shouted, her eyes finding Arik at once, as he stood with his braid flying in the wind and the machete dangling uselessly in his hand. Speak to these animals! Tell them they must leave. Tell them that no Janshi gathering of this size is permitted east of the mountains. By order of the Proctor Wyatt and the Pale Child Bacalan. Tell them. And then she saw the bitter speaker and started. And take the laser from the hand of that animal before we burn both of you down. Trembling. Necral dropped the machete from limp fingers into the water. Speaker, drop the gun, he said in Janshi, please, if you ever hope to see the far stars, let loose the laser, my friend, my child, this very now, and I will take you when Ryther comes, with me to IMRL, and farther places. The trader's voice was full of fear. The steel angels held their lasers steady, and not for a moment did he think the speaker would obey him. But strangely, meekly, she threw the laser rifle into the pool. Necral could not see to read her eyes. The squad mother relaxed visibly. God she said. Now, talk to them in their beastly talk. Tell them to leave. If not, we shall crush them. A power wagon is on its way. And now, over the roar and tumble of the nearby waters, the crawl could hear it, a heavy crunching as it rolled over trees, rending them into splinters beneath wide Duramesh treads. Perhaps they were using the blast cannon and the turret lasers to clear away boulders and other obstacles. We have told them, Necral said desperately. Many times we have told them, but they do not hear. He gestured all about him. The glade was still hot and close with Janshi bodies, and none among the clans had taken the slightest notice of the Steel Angels or the confrontation. Behind him, the clustered talkers still pressed small hands against their god. Then we shall bear the sword of Bacalon to them, the squad mother said. And perhaps they will hear their own wailing. She holstered her laser and drew a screech gun. And Necral, shuddering, knew her intent. The screechers used concentrated high-intensity sound to break down cell walls and liquefy flesh. Its effects were psychological as much as anything, there was no more horrible death. But then a second squad of the angels was among them, and there was a creak of wood straining and snapping, and from behind a final grove of fruit trees, dimly, Necral could see the black flanks of the power wagon, its blast cannons seemingly trained right at him. Two of the newcomers wore the scarlet collar, a red-faced youth with large ears who barked orders to his squad, and a huge, muscular man with a bald head and lined bronze skin. Necral recognized him. The weapons master, Kara Dahan. It was Dahan who laid a heavy hand on the squad mother's arm as she raised her screech gun. No, he said. 
It is not the way. She holstered the weapon at once. I hear and obey. Dahan looked at Nekral. Traitor, he boomed. Is this your doing? No, Nekral said. They will not disperse, the squad mother added. It would take us a day and a night to screech them down, Dahan said, his eyes sweeping over the glade and the trees, and following the rocky twisted path of the water wall up to its summit. There is an easier way. Break the pyramid, and they go at once. He stopped then, about to say something else. His eyes were on the bitter speaker. A janshi in rings and cloth, he said. They have woven nothing but death cloth up to now. This alarms me. She is one of the people of the Ring of Stone, Nikral said quickly. She has lived with me. Dahan nodded. I understand. You are truly a godless man, Nekral, to consort so with soulless animals, to teach them to ape the ways of the seed of earth. But it does not matter. He raised his arm in signal. Behind him, among the trees, the blast cannon of the power wagon moved slightly to the right. You and your pet should move at once, Dahan told Nekral. When I lower my arm, the Janshi god will burn. And if you stand in the way, you will never move again. The talkers, Nekral protested. The blast will... And he started to turn to show them. But the talkers were crawling away from the pyramid, one by one. Behind him, the angels were muttering. A miracle, one said hoarsely. Our child, our lord, cried another. Nekral stood paralyzed. The pyramid on the rock was no longer a reddish slab. Now it sparkled in the sunlight, a canopy of transparent crystal. And below that canopy, perfect in every detail, the pale child Bacalon stood smiling, with his demon reaver in his hand. The Janshi talkers were scrambling from it now, tripping in the water in their haste to be away. Nekral glimpsed the old talker, running faster than any despite his age. Even he seemed not to understand. The bitter speaker stood open-mouthed. The traitor turned. Half of the steel angels were on their knees. The rest had absent-mindedly lowered their arms, and they froze in gaping wonder. The squad mother turned to Dahan. It is a miracle, she said. As Proctor Wyatt has foreseen, the pale child walks upon this world. But the weapons master was unmoved. The Proctor is not here, and this is no miracle, he said in a steely voice. It is a trick of some enemy, and I will not be tricked. We will burn the blasphemous thing from the soil of Corlos. His arm flashed down. The angels in the power wagon must have been lax with awe. The blast cannon did not fire. Dahan turned in irritation. It is no miracle, he shouted. He began to raise his arm again. Next to Nekral, the bitter speaker suddenly cried out. He looked over with alarm and saw her eyes flash a brilliant yellow gold. The god, she muttered softly. The light returns to me. And the whine of power bows sounded from the trees around them, and two long bolts shuddered almost simultaneously in the broad back of Kara Dahan. 
The force of the shots drove the weapons master to his knees, smashed him against the ground. Run! Necrol screamed, and he shoved the bitter speaker with all his strength, and she stumbled and looked back at him briefly, her eyes dark bronze again and flickering with fear. Then, swiftly, she was running, her scarf a flutter behind her as she dodged toward the nearest green. Kill her, the squad mother shouted. Kill them all! And her words woke Janshi and Steel Angels both. The children of Bacalon lifted their lasers against the suddenly surging crowd, and the slaughter began. Necrol knelt and scrabbled on the moss-slick rocks until he had the laser rifle in his hands, then brought it to his shoulder and commenced to fire. Light stabbed out in angry bursts, once, twice, a third time. He held the trigger down, and the bursts became a beam and he sheared through the waist of a silver-helmeted angel before the fire flared in his stomach, and he fell heavily into the pool. For a long time he saw nothing. There was only pain and noise, the water gently slapping against his face, the sounds of high-pitched Janshi screaming, running all around him. Twice he heard the roar and crackle of the blast cannon, and more than twice he was stepped on. It all seemed unimportant. He struggled to keep his head on the rocks, half out of the water, but even that seemed none too vital after a while. The only thing that counted was the burning in his gut. Then, somehow, the pain went away, and there was a lot of smoke and horrible smells, but not so much noise and Necral lay quietly and listened to the voices. The pyramid, squad mother? someone asked. It is a miracle, a woman's voice replied. Look, Bacalon stands there yet, and see how he smiles. We have done right here today. What should we do with it? Lift it aboard the power wagon. We shall bring it back to Proctor Wyatt. Soon after, the voices went away, and Necral heard only the sound of the water rushing down endlessly, falling and tumbling. It was a very restful sound. He decided he would sleep. The crewman shoved the crowbar down between the slats and lifted. The thin wood hardly protested at all before it gave. More statues, Janice, he reported, after reaching inside the crate and tugging loose some of the packing material. Worthless, Ryther said with a brief sigh. She stood in the broken ruins of Necral's trading base. The angels had ransacked it searching for armed Janshi, and debris lay everywhere but they had not touched the crates. The crewman took his crowbar and moved on to the next stack of crated artifacts. Ryther looked wistfully at the three Janshi who clustered around her, wishing they could communicate a little better. One of them, a sleek female who wore a trailing scarf and a lot of jewelry and seemed always to be leaning on a power bow, knew a smattering of Terran, but hardly enough, she picked up things quickly, but so far the only thing of substance she had said was, Jameson world, Arik take us, angels kill. That she had repeated endlessly, until Ryther had finally made her understand that yes, they would take them. The other two Janshi, the pregnant female and the male with the laser, never seemed to talk at all. Statues again, the crewman said, having pulled a crate from atop the stack in the ruptured storeroom and pried it open. Ryther shrugged. The crewman moved on. She turned her back on him and wandered slowly outside, to the edge of the space field where the lights of Jolastar rested, its open ports bright with yellow light in the gathering gloom of dusk. The Janshi followed her, as they had followed her since she arrived. Afraid, no doubt, that she would go away and leave them if they took their great bronze eyes off her for an instant. Statues, 
Rither muttered, half to herself and half to the Genshi. She shook her head. Why did he do it? She asked them, knowing they could not understand. A traitor of his experience. You could tell me, maybe, if you knew what I was saying. Instead of concentrating on death cloths and such, on real Janshi art, why did Arik train you people to carve alien versions of human gods? He should have known no dealer would accept such obvious frauds. Alien art is alien. She sighed. My fault, I suppose. We should have opened the crates. She laughed. The bitter speaker stared at her. Arik Deathcloth gave. Ryther nodded abstractly. She had it now, hanging just above her bunk. A strange, small thing, woven partly from janshi fur and mostly from long, silken strands of flame-red hair. On it, gray against the red, was a crude but recognizable caricature of Arik Nekral. She had wondered at that, too. The tribute of the widow? A child? Or just a friend? What had happened to Arik during the year the lights had been away? If only she had been back on time, then... But she'd lost three months on Jameson's world, checking dealer after dealer in an effort to unload the worthless statuettes. It had been middle autumn before the lights of Jolastar returned to Corlos. To find Necral's base in ruins, the angels already gathering in their harvests. And the angels... When she'd gone to them, offering the hold of unwanted lasers, offering to trade, the sight on those blood-red city walls had sickened even her. She had thought she'd gone prepared, but the obscenity she encountered was beyond any preparation. A squad of steel angels found her, vomiting beyond the tall rusty gates, and had escorted her inside before the proctor. Wyatt was twice as skeletal as she remembered him. He had been standing outdoors near the foot of a huge platform altar that had been erected in the middle of the city. A startlingly lifelike statue of Bacalon, encased in a glass pyramid and set atop a high redstone plinth, threw a long shadow over the wooden altar. Beneath it, the squads of angels were piling the newly harvested neo-grass and wheat and the frozen carcasses of bush hogs. We do not need your trade, the proctor told her. The world of Corlos is many times blessed, my child, and Bacalon lives among us now. He has worked vast miracles and shall work more. Our faith is in him. Wyatt gestured toward the altar with a thin hand. See, in tribute we burn our winter stores, for the pale child has promised that this year winter will not come, and he has taught us to cull ourselves in peace, as once we were culled in war, so the seed of earth grows ever stronger. It is a time of great new revelation. His eyes had burned as he spoke to her, eyes darting and fanatic, vast and dark, yet strangely flecked with gold. As quickly as she could, Ryther had left the city of the Steel Angels, trying hard not to look back at the walls. But when she had climbed the hills, back toward the trading base, she had come to the Ring of Stone to the broken pyramid where Arik had taken her. Then Ryther found that she could not resist, and powerless, she had turned for a final glance out over Sword Valley. The sight had stayed with her. Outside the walls, the angel children hung, 
a row of small, white-smocked bodies, still and motionless, at the end of long ropes. They had gone peacefully, all of them. But death is seldom peaceful. The older ones, at least, died quickly, necks broken with a sudden snap. But the small, pale infants had the nooses round their waists, and it had seemed clear to Ryther that most of them had simply hung there till they starved. As she stood, remembering, the crewman came from inside Necral's broken bubble. Nothing, he reported. All statues. Ryther nodded. Go, the bitter speaker said. Jameson World? Yes, she replied, her eyes staring past the waiting lights of Jolistar, out toward the black primal forest. The heart of Bacalon was sunk forever. In a thousand, thousand woods and a single city, the clans had begun to pray. <laughs>